Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Fourteen days after the war is a compromise in sight. Some major statements have come in, some significant concessions from Ukraine's side and words of reassurance from Russia. But it's still early days. As they say, there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. Plus, the fighting is very much on. A lot depends on how both sides build on these initial overtures. The foreign ministers of Ukraine and Russia are meeting in Turkey tomorrow. Kiev has learned the hard way. Depending on the West, counting on their support was a bad idea. They put their interests first after all the big talk about protecting Ukraine and punishing Russia. One of the big losers in this saga is Joe Biden, the US president. He's lost the plot again and he's losing traditional allies. The Saudis and Emiratis are apparently not taking his calls. The Europeans are not backing his oil sanctions. On Gravitas tonight, we'll discuss all of this and more. Day 14 of the Russian invasion, Ukraine stands completely devastated. Two weeks of war and this is what the country looks like. We'll start with the city of Kharkiv. This is the city council. Before the war, this is what it looked like, a majestic building framed by trees. Then it was struck by a Russian missile and here's what's left of it. Same with the city hall in Kharkiv. Before the war, a towering presence. Now it is surrounded by debris. And Kharkiv is not an exception. This is the story of Erpin, of Kiev, of Yasinovataya. Russian attacks have devastated all of these cities. Their bombs have destroyed government buildings, schools, airports, even homes. What is Russia's endgame? The plan, we are told, was to take Kiev in two weeks. This is what Western assessment said. It hasn't happened. Fourteen days down the line, where is this heading? A compromise, perhaps. There are positive signals coming out of Kiev and Moscow. Two very important statements have been made in the last 24 hours. The first one was from Kiev. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has made a major shift. Ukraine is no longer interested in a NATO membership. This is what their president said. Remember, this was one of the biggest bones of contention. Now Ukraine is ready to give in on this front. No NATO membership. Moscow was quick to respond. It said it is not trying to overthrow the government in Ukraine. Both sides now want to talk peace. But how serious are these offers? Is this the making of a compromise? Is Russia ready to end this war? On Gravitas tonight, we will discuss this. We'll start with the details of Zelensky's offer. The Ukrainian president has been applauded for his bravery, for standing up to Russia. But 14 days down the line, he's taking a more pragmatic approach. Zelensky has softened his position. Ukraine is no longer insisting on NATO membership, and I cannot overstate the significance of the shift. Remember, Ukraine's desire to join NATO is enshrined in its constitution. But President Zelensky seems ready to give up that dream. He says he's, quote-unquote, cooled down about NATO. Let me quote from what he said. The alliance is afraid of controversial things and confrontation with Russia. I never wanted to be a country which is begging something on its knees. We are not going to be that country and I don't want to be that president. This is the leader of Ukraine, Zelensky. He followed up those offers, uh, those words rather, with an offer. 
we have the possible solution, resolution for these three items, key items. What needs to be done is for President Putin to start talking, start the dialogue, instead of living in the informational bubble without oxygen. I think that's where he is. He is in this bubble. He's getting this information, and you don't know how realistic that information is that he's getting. Basically, Ukraine is ready to concede on three Russian demands. Number one, give up membership of NATO. Number two, recognize Crimea as part of Russia, the area that Russia annexed in 2014. That's Crimea. And demand number three, recognize the independence of Donetsk and Lugansk. Now, these two regions are in Donbass. They're controlled by Russian separatists. And Vladimir Putin declared both of these regions as independent republics before launching this war. That was more than 14 days ago. Now, President Zelensky of Ukraine says he is willing to negotiate on all three points. And this is a very big climb down. What is Moscow's reaction? They're ready to talk. The Kremlin, too, has softened its position. The Russian foreign ministry held a press conference today. It said that Russia is not trying to overthrow the government in Ukraine. Let me quote from that statement. The Russian army's aim is not to occupy Ukraine or the destruction of its statehood or the overthrow of the government. It is not directed against the civilian population. So both Ukraine and Russia are signaling truce. Does that mean the war is ending? Well, it's too early to say. Russian forces are still in Ukraine. They're still attacking. They're still trying to enter Kiev. Their bombing operations continue. Kiev saw an air raid alert today. Residents were told to rush to bomb shelters. One of the regional leaders sent out a message. This is what it said. Kiev region air alert, threat of a missile attack, everyone immediately to shelters. You know when such alerts are issued? When there is a threat of aerial bombing. So far, Russia has not actively used its air force in Ukraine, but that might change. If talks fail again, the foreign ministers of Russia and Ukraine are meeting in Turkey. We'll keep track. But here's what's changed in the last few days. When Russia's invasion began, President Zelensky was defiant. He promised to defend every inch of Ukraine's territory. Now he's open to concessions. He's open to abandoning his quest for NATO membership. So what exactly changed in 14 days? In simple words, Zelensky got a taste of reality. He made three strategic miscalculations. Number one, he overestimated Western support. Number two, he oversold Ukraine's importance to the West. And number three, he misread Putin's real intentions. We'll take them one by one. Zelensky knew that Ukraine was no match for Russia. It was evident for everyone watching the situation. The army, the finances, everything was stacked against him. But Zelensky thought he had a Trump card, the West, and he had good reason to think so. Joe Biden refused to guarantee Ukraine's neutrality. He refused to pull back from NATO's eastern flank. Instead, he expanded military assistance. He flooded Ukraine with lethal weapons. Clearly, Biden was invested in the fight. The question was, how invested? Listen into what Zelensky said on the 1st of September last year, weeks before the Russian buildup began. I feel that President Biden, well, not only do I feel, I heard that he personally supports Ukraine on the issue of granting NATO membership. But it's hard for me to tell what the path is going to be like. This was September 2021. In fact, let's go back further to April 2021. That was Russia's first military buildup. Back then, Zelensky seemed very confident of America's support. Listen to what he said. President Biden. President Biden assured me that Ukraine will never be left alone against Russian aggression. Ukraine will never be left alone. April 2021, that was Biden's promise. So naturally, Zelensky hoped for big things. He thought the military aid was just the start, that more would come, more help. But he was wrong. Military aid was NATO's maximum limit. They refused to go beyond that. No soldiers on the ground, no no-fly zones, nothing that would pit them against Russia. Same with sanctions. It's day 14 of the invasion and Europe is still buying Russian oil and gas. The fact is, the West led Ukraine on. They refused to compromise. They promised all the support, but when the time came, NATO stood back and watched. Miscalculation number two, Zelensky overestimated Ukraine's importance to the West. 
It was evident in his words. He called Ukraine the shield of Europe. Listen to this. For eight years, Ukraine has been a shield. For eight years, Ukraine has been holding back one of the greatest armies in the world, which stands along our borders, not the borders of the European Union. And the missile systems flew to Mariupol, not to European cities. These events confirm that comprehensive security in Europe is impossible if Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity is not restored. Again, he was wrong. Ukraine was expendable for the West. They were not serious about the NATO membership. They were not serious about the sanctions. For them, Ukraine was just a useful tool, something to irritate Vladimir Putin, that's all. But that useful tool had an expiry date. It was February 24th when Russia invaded. And this has happened before. Think back to Afghanistan in the 1980s. America funded the Mujahideen to fight the Soviet army. Was it because Afghanistan was strategically important for the West? No, it wasn't. The sole objective was to give the Soviets a bloody nose. Afghanistan was also a useful tool for the Americans. Same with Georgia. America armed them in the late 2000s. They trained Georgian soldiers. They promised NATO membership in the future. But when war broke out, NATO recoiled. Zelensky made that very same mistake. He believed that Ukraine was a key strategic asset for NATO. He was wrong. For NATO, Ukraine was just another pawn. Miscalculation number three, Zelensky failed to read Putin's mind. On this, you cannot really blame him. Until the last moment, nobody thought there would be a war. There would be threats, some saber rattling perhaps, but eventually Russia would pull back. That was a conventional wisdom. Even as late as January 28, Zelensky did not buy the war hysteria. This is what he said. The feeling from the media is that we have a war. We have troops on the roads, we have mobilization, people are going somewhere. It does not. We do not need this panic. In hindsight, should he have prepared better? Should he have considered Putin's proposals more seriously? Perhaps he should. But put yourself in Zelensky's boots. You have the world's most powerful military alliance promising support. You have lethal weapons pouring in every day. You have promises of unprecedented sanctions on Russia. It is not surprising that Zelensky decided to fight. The West promised him sovereignty, but they refused to fight for it. And history will judge him for that. All this Twitter fanfare, all this YouTube glory will disappear. What will remain is this. Ukraine is making the same compromises that Russia first demanded. In fact, more than that, Russia was only demanding neutrality then. No joining the NATO. That's what they wanted. Now they want Zelensky to recognize Donbass and Crimea. The difference is hundreds of innocent Ukrainians are now dead. And history will also judge Joe Biden, how he led Ukraine down the war path, how his failed diplomacy gave Russia the advantage. Do you remember what Biden said after taking office? America is back, he said. Diplomacy is back. Back to where exactly? Let me show you. Joe Biden's immediate priority is to stabilize oil prices, to make West Asian countries pump more oil. Just one problem. He cannot get through to them. And I mean literally. According to U.S. media reports, the leaders of Saudi Arabia and the UAE are not answering Biden's calls. When did that happen? We don't have a specific date, but reports say in the last few weeks, the White House tried to arrange two calls. One with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the second with the UAE Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan. Both men, the Saudi and the Emirati, refused to take the call. But do you know what's even more humiliating? Both of these leaders spoke to Vladimir Putin. What does the snub reveal? A trust deficit. Both Saudi Arabia and the UAE are key U.S. defense partners. They depend on American weapons. They depend on American leadership. And Biden has failed to give both. He cut off military support for the war in Yemen. He declassified documents linked to the Khashoggi murder. Maybe the intentions were good, but the fact is, actions have consequences. You cannot alienate leaders and then count on their support. If you do, they will not pick up your call. Joe Biden should know this. He keeps bragging about his 50-year career, about his foreign policy chops. But what has he achieved with all this experience? He could not even unite the West. Each country was saying something different. Biden said Nord Stream 2 would be cancelled. Germany refused to comment. Biden said 
He was open to cutting Russia off from SWIFT. Europe was not. And now Biden says he is banning Russian oil and gas. Again, Europe is not. On Nord Stream and SWIFT, Europe did relent. But by then it was too late. Russia had already reached the gates of Kiev. Biden had enough time to prepare to reach out to his allies to work on joint sanctions. But Joe Biden, the president of the United States, was slow to react. His supporters say it's part of quiet diplomacy. Well, maybe it is, but Biden's diplomacy was so quiet, Russia could not even hear it. And the president has a history of this. On most foreign policy issues, Joe Biden has been wrong. We made a list for you today. In 1991, he opposed the war against Iraq. As it turned out, it was a resounding military and diplomatic success. In 2003, he supported the invasion of Iraq. Well, we all know how that turned out. Mistake number three came in 2011. Joe Biden changed his position on Iraq. He pushed then-President Barack Obama to withdraw U.S. soldiers. And what happened next? Sectarian violence, more meddling from Iran, and finally the emergence of ISIS. Mistake number four, Biden said the collapse of Afghanistan civilian government was not, quote-unquote, inevitable. As it turned out, it was inevitable. The Taliban conquered Afghanistan even before America's evacuation. Take any foreign policy decision, chances are Joe Biden chose the wrong side. I'll give you another example. This is from 1997, when Biden was a senator. He was responding to a simple question. If NATO expands eastward, would Russia move closer to China? Listen to his reply. They talked about they don't want this NATO expansion. They know it's not in their security interests and on and on and said, well, and if you do that, we may have to look to China. And I couldn't help using the colloquial expression from my state by saying to Zaganov, lots of luck in your senior year. Um, you know, uh, good luck. And if, not, if that doesn't work, try Iran. Condescending, ignorant and most importantly, wrong. Russia is moving closer to China. Both countries have agreed on a strategic partnership. They're working to blunt Western sanctions. We just told you how Zelensky made grave miscalculations. Well, at least Zelensky is a political novice. What excuse does Biden have? He failed to foresee two major political realities of today, Russia's opposition to NATO expansion and the rise of China. As president, those mistakes still haunt him. Just think about it. The whole world knows who the aggressor is. The whole world sympathizes with Ukraine, at least privately. Yet Joe Biden has failed to create a global coalition. The unity that he keeps harping on, he keeps talking about, is at best Western unity. And that too is cracking. What about his West Asian allies? What about the Indo-Pacific? They're still not on board. The truth is Europe would have reacted furiously no matter what. After all, this war is in their backyard. The question is... What has America brought to the table? Until now, nothing. One year into his presidency, Joe Biden has single-handedly bungled Pax Americana. And here is one of the reasons why no one trusts the U.S. Because the United States is never a partner. It's always playing the class monitor. It wants to dictate, not participate. It wants to decide how the West should respond, how NATO should respond, who should be doing what. Look at what happened with Poland. It wanted to give its entire fleet of fighter jets to Ukraine free of charge. Poland was offering 28 MiG-29 fighters. This was their plan. Poland transfers them to the U.S. And then the U.S. gives them to Ukrainian pilots. Why go through America? Why not give it directly to Ukraine? Two reasons. One, Poland wants America to help with the transfer and logistics. And two, this is not a donation. Poland does want something in return, a fleet of American F-16s. And this offer was officially announced. Then America shot it down, and the Polish Prime Minister had to make an embarrassing retreat. We were always emphasizing that Poland is not party to this war, and NATO is not party to this war. Uh, this is why any decisions of delivering um, offensive weapon has to be taken by the entire NATO on a unanimous basis. And this is why we are ready to give uh, all our, of our fleet uh, of uh, jet fighters uh, to Rammstein, but we are not uh, ready to make any moves on our own because, as I said, we are not party uh, to this war. 
the U.S. was actively negotiating with Poland for this transfer. Then why did they bomb it? Why does the United States not want Ukraine to have fighter jets? The Pentagon says the proposal had some quote-unquote logistical problems. In fact, let me quote from the official statement for you. We will continue to consult with Poland and our other NATO allies about this issue and the difficult logistical challenges it presents, but we do not believe Poland's proposal is a tenable one. The White House said the same thing. This is Poland's sovereign decision to make. Uh, we have in no way opposed Poland transferring planes to Ukraine. But to go to the source of your question here, I think, Cecilia, there are a number of challenging practical questions, including how the planes would actually be transferred from Poland to Ukraine, right? So are they going to fly? Where will they depart from? Where will they land? Those are all very important questions here. What does that mean? The U.S. says Poland can transfer the jets if it wants to, but it should not expect the U.S. to help. President Zelensky of Ukraine is furious. Listen to what he said. There is an official decision by Poland to hand over the planes to the relevant base, the American base. We also have confirmation. We have all heard, we have read it in the media, that there is an agreement between the American side and Poland, that it has been reached. But at the same time, we hear that Poland's proposal appears to be unreasonable. And this is what they say in Washington. We have read and seen this too. So when will there be a decision? The fact is, Ukraine needs air power if it wants to win this battle or have a fighting chance, more like. America knows that, but it won't give Ukraine fighter jets because it does not want to engage with the Russian air force in any way. Russia would see a NATO transfer of jets to Ukraine as a serious escalation, as a direct confrontation between Russia and NATO. Washington does not want that. NATO members like Poland do want to fight. Warsaw was willing to send its jets to the Ramstein Air Base in Germany. This is an American air base. It is designed to contribute to NATO missions. Poland called on other NATO nations to use their inventory too. Slovakia, for one, is willing to answer Poland's call. It is also considering a possible transfer of jets. But what is holding them back? Lack of consensus. And the reluctance of major powers like the US. Recently, a Polish diplomat exposed the divisions within NATO. Allow me to tell you what he said. We can act on behalf of NATO, but we need support in doing so. And not every Western country feels safe or comfortable with that. What we would really like to avoid is providing jets to Ukraine and then being left alone because it was our call. Th these differences could become deeper in the coming days. French President Emmanuel Macron is about to host European leaders for talks. And he's expected to make another pitch for a European army. It's, it's pet project. He wants a European army. Ahead of these talks, Macron said, and I quote, our European defense needs to enter a new phase. We can no longer depend on others. Read that as we can no longer depend on the U.S. Macron made no effort to hide its, his intentions. He is sending this message to the United States, the power that is holding back the delivery of fighter jets to Ukraine. And he has more proof of these divisions among these Western powers, among NATO allies, Joe Biden's oil embargo on Russia. He has banned Russian oil imports to the United States, a decision that has split the West's response. European countries are not in favor of such a ban. They say they're too dependent on Moscow to impose a ban like this. So what kind of impact will Biden's decision really have? Does it really hurt Russia economically or is it yet another symbolic move? Our next report has some answers. Today, I'm announcing the United States is targeting the main artery of Russia's economy. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy. After weeks of will he, won't he, Joe Biden has done what his lawmakers wanted. He has sanctioned Russian oil, banned Moscow from exporting oil to the United States. How will this impact Russia? Will it deal a body blow to Putin's war machine? Far from it. It's a fact that Russia's biggest economic asset right now is its oil and gas sector. But Biden's sanctions are more like a free hit. The numbers tell you why. In 2021, Russia accounted for just 8% of American oil imports. 
That's around 245 million barrels per year or 672,000 barrels a day. It's a fairly modest amount. This ban hurts neither America nor Russia. So turning off the tap is relatively easy for the U.S. In the short term, again, the U.S. doesn't import that much um, oil and gas from Russia. And so this is, um, this is more of a, a moral statement than um, you know, significant economic impact. There, there is impact on the margins. No significant economic impact for the U.S., same for Russia. It can make up for the loss of American business by selling oil to Asian customers like China or India. So what does the ban really do? It splits the West's response against Russia. The fractures are evident. The European Union hasn't joined America's embargo. 24 hours before it was announced, European nations made it clear that they will not join the ban. This is hardly surprising. The EU gets 40% of its crude oil and 45% of its gas supplies from Russia. This dependency has made sure they cannot ban Russian energy. Uh, Bulgaria will support all kinds of measures because we are really against the war. But these two um, maybe will ask for an exception. In other words, uh, we're not so, uh, we just cannot have, we don't have current alternatives right now. We're too dependent. All my American colleagues assured me during the talks that they are all in a different situation than Germany and Europe. The USA is an oil exporting country. Russian imports account for 7.5%. Germany is an oil importing country. Russian imports account for 35%. You told me in the conversation that we neither demand nor will demand that Germany does the same. The third problem with America's move is the risk of a Russian retaliation. The EU may not have stopped Russian oil imports for now, but it's planning to cut its dependency on Russia in the long run. Moscow says it won't let this go unanswered. It's threatening to shut oil pipelines to Europe. So to put it simply, this oil ban may be a symbolic move for Washington, but it could prove to be a risky gamble for Europe. Where does all of this leave Russia? On the winner's seat, possibly. If you zoom out a little on the map, you'll find Russia floating like an isolated island cut off from most of the world. Russia has become the world's most sanctioned country. As we speak, there are at least 5,000 sanctions against Russia, 5,000. It's on top of the table. And well ahead of countries like Iran, Syria, even North Korea. Russia has managed to attract more sanctions than Iran, Venezuela, Myanmar and Cuba combined. How did that happen? Well, you're thinking the war and you're right. But the story begins well before that. Remember, Russia once annexed Crimea. Before that, the erstwhile Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. That's when the embargo and sanction juggernaut against Russia really started rolling. By the 22nd of February this year, 2022, Russia had more than 2,700 sanctions slapped against it already. The Kremlin then decided to recognize the independence of Donbass. And soon after, it invaded Ukraine and sanctions began raining on Russia all over again. It was being showered with fresh sanctions every other day. The tally now exceeds 5,000. Let's show you something for context. Iran was previously the world's most sanctioned country. There were 3,600 sanctions against Iran. Syria was next with more than 2,600 sanctions. Next was North Korea, then Venezuela, Myanmar, finally Cuba. Like you can see, Russia is currently leading this club. Who's placed Russia in this precarious situation? Mostly countries in the West, you know, NATO and its allies. They have all sanctioned Russia, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Canada, Australia, Switzerland, Japan, the European Union, Australia. Uh, they're all leading the sanction warfare. What have they targeted? Russian industries, Russian individuals, Russian economy, the assets of Russian banks. They've been frozen. Selected banks have been removed from SWIFT. Russian oligarchs have been sanctioned. So have members of the Russian parliament and the Security Council. President Vladimir Putin's foreign assets have been frozen. Assets belonging to Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, have also been frozen. Sanctions have also been imposed on Putin's press secretary, Dmitry Peskov. Russian flights have been banned. Russian defense and shipbuilding companies have been banned too. It's a long list. We're talking about 5,000 plus sanctions, remember. 
While the Russian elites and industries think of ways to navigate these bans, ordinary Russians are not feeling on top of the world either. Their lives have been wrecked by this war that their president is waging. And Western brands have been forced to desert them. Again, we have a long list. McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Starbucks. They've suspended operations in Russia. So have Levi's, Nike, TikTok, PepsiCo, Apple, Netflix, Zara, H&M. They've all, all paused sales in Russia. Walt Disney, Paramount Pictures, Sony Corp and Warner Media have halted or postponed the release of their movies in Russia. MasterCard, Visa, Amex. They've suspended operations. So have Airbnb, Aston Martin, Spotify, Amazon, KPMG, ENY, McKinsey, PwC. They've refused to work with Russian clients. According to one estimate, at least 124 companies have paused their businesses in Russia. So if an ordinary Russian wants to dine out today, his or her options are limited. No KFC, no Taco Bell, no McDonald's. Perhaps healthier choices. If she wants to shop, she will have to think outside Estee Lauder, Chanel, Ikea, Prada, Puma, H&M or Zara. She cannot buy a new Apple iPhone or a Samsung gadget or Lego for children. Also, there is no Amazon delivery, no Netflix on television, no Spotify on phones, no Hollywood thrillers in the box office, no Coca-Cola at restaurants or Pizza Hut in the locality. So this is what it looks like to be the world's most sanctioned country. Now, it depends on Russia how it wants to wear the badge. Kremlin can celebrate its potential geopolitical gains, brush the bleeding economy under the carpet and live like North Korea. Alternatively, Putin can tell the Russian Gen Z that they will grow up healthier than the rest of the world, uncorrupted by Western fast food, free of Netflix addiction, the glass half filled or half empty. Either way, it's on Russia's table. Our next story is from Pakistan, where Imran Khan faces his biggest challenge so far, a no-confidence vote. It's set to be held in a few days from now. Ahead of the vote, the opposition is trying to drum up support. Last night, they held a massive rally in Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan. Leading it was Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, the chairman of Pakistan People's Party. Here's a report on how that played out. Slogans. Songs. And slip of tongues. This was how Pakistan's opposition rallied against Imran Khan in Islamabad. It was a protest like no other, all thanks to the man leading it, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, the prodigal son of Benazir Bhutto, the chairman of Pakistan People's Party, and a gift that keeps giving. Addressing a sea of supporters, Bhutto came up with yet another gem. He told the crowd how their enthusiasm was giving him goosebumps. But where his legs should have been shivering, his shivers were legging. It's true what they say. There's a meme for every moment in Pakistan. But this protest was more than just about memes. It was about the political future of Imran Khan. He's set to face a no-confidence vote, one that would see him get dethroned. So Bhutto Jr. used this rally to build support for the motion. He called Imran Khan a puppet. He mocked him through his own slogans. And he said that the entire nation wanted the Prime Minister out. Yeh 
پورا قوم ایک ہو کے پاکستان پیپلز پارٹی کا پیج پہ آ چکے ہیں The warning's done with. It was time to cut loose and dance. But those supporters swayed to the tunes of one political anthem after another. It almost seemed like a rock concert. The party went on late into the night, and it clearly irked those living in glass houses. The ruling lawmakers of Pakistan, they're calling the no-confidence motion and the huge turnout at opposition rallies the handiwork of foreign conspirators. Leading the charge is Shafqat Mahmood, the education minister of Pakistan. He shared this picture, alleging that both Europe and the United States are conspiring to remove the Pakistani Prime Minister from power. This claim has been reiterated by Imran Khan himself. He says a global plot is underway to topple him. From where we see it, it seems more like an internal plot. Hatched by the real rulers of Pakistan, the army generals. Last we checked, they had refused to take sides in the ongoing political turmoil. Protests happened in Turkey too. The occasion was International Women's Day. The cause, the Uyghur genocide in China. Unlike their president, these women are not afraid of China. Thousands of them gathered in Istanbul. It was raining, it was messy, but they stood resolute. Most of them were carrying missing posters. On those posters were pictures of activists, family members, basically Uyghur Muslims who disappeared in China. These protests continued well into the night. Reports say anti-Pakistan banners were carried. Prime Minister Imran Khan was also condemned for his silence. Now this takes a lot of guts. For starters, Turkey's President Erdogan is not a fan of protests. On the other hand, he is a fan of China. Erdogan's position on Uyghurs is a classic case of hypocrisy. In 2009, he was a vocal critic. He called China's actions a genocide. Remember, this was before Xi Jinping's presidency, when nobody was talking about the Uyghurs. Erdogan was. 2009. And now that everyone is talking about Uyghurs, Erdogan is not. In 2019, he visited China. He said people were trying to exploit the Uyghurs to spoil Turkey's relationship with China. Who exactly are these people? Erdogan did not say that. Last year, there were similar protests outside the Chinese embassy in Turkey. For the first few months, Erdogan was patient. Then he cracked down. Dozens of people were arrested. The protests were dubbed as a Western conspiracy. So what explains this change? How did Recep Tayyip Erdogan go from being a vocal critic to a silent supporter? Because he needs Chinese money. Turkey is key to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Think of it as a corridor from Europe to Turkey, to the Caucasus, to Central Asia, to China. Without Turkey, this plan is impossible. And talk about role reversals. It was the Ottoman Empire that ended the ancient Silk Route. Today, Turkey is resolved to reviving it. For the Uyghurs, this is a massive tragedy. Turkey is home to around 50,000 ethnic Uyghurs. It was a safe haven for them. But under President Erdogan, that is changing fast. Uyghurs who apply for citizenship are being rejected. Apparently, they are national security threats now. What is their real crime? Speaking out against China, that's what they've done wrong. Dozens of Uyghurs who criticize China have been denied citizenship. Others have been extradited on Beijing's request. Does this mean that Turkey is firmly on China's side? Well, until recently that was the case, but in the last few months, Turkey's domestic situation has worsened. Their currency has hit rock bottom. Inflation is at a 20-year high and America has imposed sanctions. Simply put, there is immense pressure on Erdogan and that pressure is forcing a balancing act. The first indication was in July last year. Erdogan spoke to Xi Jinping on the phone. He told Xi that Uyghurs must live in peace as equal citizens of China. The second indication was in October. 43 nations signed a declaration demanding equal rights and freedoms for Uyghurs. Among the signatories was Turkey. In 2019 and 2020, Turkey refused to sign similar declarations, but last year they did. 
And now don't mistake this for activism. Erdogan is just playing both sides. His politics is still based on convenience, not principles. He will back Pakistan and Kashmir. He will support Hamas and Palestine. But he will use half measures on China. Having said that, protests like this one will keep the spotlight on Xinjiang. It will force Erdogan to make cosmetic criticisms. Beyond that, he will not interfere. In Erdogan's grand vision of an Islamic empire, the Uyghurs are not his subjects. Now let's take a look at what else is making news around the world. This is Gravitas Global Headlines. The Ukrainian military agrees to a 12-hour ceasefire with Russia to allow evacuation of civilians through corridors, including from the besieged city of Sumy. Millions of civilians remain stuck in dire conditions across Ukraine. American giants McDonald's, Coca-Cola and Starbucks suspend their operations in Russia amid intense pressure over Russia's assault. Russia is facing unprecedented sanctions following its invasion of Ukraine. Power has been entirely cut to the Chernobyl power plant, the site of the world's worst nuclear disaster in 1986, and its security systems, Ukraine's energy operator says. The UN atomic watchdog says it saw no critical impact on safety from the loss of power. In a video summit with his French and German counterparts, Chinese President Xi Jinping called for maximum restraint to prevent a humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, but strongly opposed sanctions imposed against Russia by the West over its war against Ukraine. A Texas man has been convicted of storming the U.S. Capitol with a holstered handgun in a milestone victory for federal prosecutors involved in cases related to last year's riot. The verdict could be a bellwether for many other Capitol riot cases. Hong Kong announces plans to devote more medical resources to the elderly as COVID cases spread across care homes. COVID-related deaths continue to climb rapidly among unvaccinated senior citizens. South Korea's presidential election remains too close to call as voting ends in a race which will shape Asia's fourth largest economy for the next five years. The bitter campaign was marred by scandals and smears. Australia declares a national emergency in response to the devastating floods along its east coast. My intention to recommend to the Governor-General a national emergency declaration covering the severe weather and flooding events across both New South Wales and Queensland. Authorities designate catastrophe zones in towns swept away by swollen rivers. Liverpool have booked their place in the quarter-finals of the Champions League despite a 1-0 defeat to Inter Milan at Anfield. Lotaro Martinez scored the only goal of the game, but Liverpool's 2-0 victory from the first leg meant that they won the tie. Meanwhile, German giants Bayern Munich thrashed Red Bull Salzburg 7-1 to complete an 8-2 aggregate win. Reigning champions England slumped to a second straight defeat in the ICC Women's World Cup as West Indies claimed a seven-run victory in Dunedin. Batting first, West Indies set a target of 226, courtesy Shemaine Campbell's 66. England recovered from a rocky start and a mid-innings revival got them back in the contest. But it wasn't enough as they were bowled out for 218. With that, it's a wrap on this episode of Gravitas. We're leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching.